So now that we have life on Earth, we have these life forms changing and evolving and eventually occupying all of these awesome and different environments on Earth. So how do we actually catalog these guys? Well, the first thing we need to do is divide them up into their smallest group. How do we define the smallest group of organisms? Now, some of this is easy. You can look at two people and notice that they're the same species. Um, but sometimes it's a little bit harder. You might look at these two flowers here, this Persian buttercup and a pink rose, and think, wow, those look really similar. They're the same color. They have the same petal shape um, and overall look very similar. Or how about this golden tamarind and this orangutan? They also look really similar. You can see that there are some differences, but there's also some differences in these individuals over here that you've called their own species. So how do we actually define these groups? So this video is going to talk about how biologists um, organize and categorize uh, groups of living species on Earth. So there are some different ways that you can define a species. The most widely used one is called the biological species concept. Now the biological species concept says that if you have a natural population, so you have a group of organisms uh, living in their environment, they are considered a species if two things happen. One is that they can interbreed with each other, or they could possibly interbreed. Um, the other is that they don't interbreed with other or cannot interbreed with other organisms outside of their group. So we're sort of defining species by how they can reproduce. Can they reproduce with other organisms within their population or within a wider group? And if so, they're considered a species, particularly if they cannot also breed with other similar organisms. So think about a domestic dog and a coyote. They can interbreed, domestic dogs can interbreed with one another, coyotes can interbreed with one another. They're two different species. But when you if they were to breed, they would not produce viable offspring. They cannot reproduce together. And that is what the biological species concept says. So species are groups of organisms that can interbreed with one another um, or could possibly interbreed um, with one another if they were not in some way separated or isolated because sometimes populations could breed they just don't encounter each other so if they could breed were they able to encounter each other they are considered a species and then of course they also have to be isolated from other groups so now what about these weird animals that we see in captivity sometimes? Uh, here's an example of a zorse, which is a zebra and a horse. Um, a mule is another example. Uh, ligers and tigons, these are crosses between lions and tigers. What about those guys? We have said that these groups have to be able to interbreed. Well, these guys are a little bit different because they're not going to do that in the wild. A donkey and a horse are probably not going to breed in a wild. A zebra and a horse are probably not going to interbreed because they probably aren't encountering one another. Um, so the part of this is that they can encounter and each other and breed under natural conditions. Um, if it's not going to happen naturally, they're not considered a species. The other thing that's really important here um, related to the biological species concept is that they have to be able to produce viable offspring. So if you think about a mule, a mule is the cross between a um, male donkey and a female horse. And mules are sterile, which means you can't breed two mules together and get more mules. You have to breed donkeys and horses together. So part of this biological species concept is not only can they interbreed with one another, but can they also produce viable offspring? That is to say that can they also produce children that can have children? And if not, they're considered 
different species. So a donkey and a horse or a zebra and a horse might be able to actually interbreed, physically capable of interbreeding. But if their genetic line, so to speak, stops with their child, with the, with the zorse or with the mule, um, they're not considered, they're considered two separate species. They're not considered one species. So there are different ways that this reproductive isolation can occur. So there are two main types of barriers that prevent the production of viable offspring. The first is called a prezygotic barrier. So remember that the term zygote means a fertilized egg. So we saw this when we were doing our genetics chapter and you have an egg and you have a sperm and they come together and they produce a fertilized egg. That fertilized egg is called a zygote. So a prezygotic barrier is a barrier between species that happens even before fertilization, before the production of a uh, fertilized egg. So a prezygotic barrier is one that limits individuals from physically being able to mate. They are in some way incompatible in their actual physical mating ability. Um, so one example of this is there's a particular type of snails and they have these snails have either uh, left hand curls on their shells or right hand curls on their shells. Now, based on which way their curl goes, their reproductive organs face different directions. And so the left-handed swirled snails, I might have said squirrels. If I did, I'm not talking about squirrels. I'm talking about snails. The left-handed swirled snails cannot physically breed with the right-handed swirled snails because their reproductive organs never face each other. So this is a prezygotic barrier, something there's a physical barrier between the individuals. Now this also could be a uh, behavioral or a location based barrier. Um, so for example, if uh, you have a mountain range in between and two populations physically cannot ever encounter one another, this could be a prezygotic barrier. Um, that is not to say that they could never, but it's sort of the start of how we get the introduction of species. Um, the other way that you can have a prezygotic barrier is if individuals are actually um, physically able to mate, um, but the sperm cannot actually fertilize the egg and produce a viable egg. So both of those, um, physically able to mate and able to produce the zygote are both considered um, ways that you can limit uh, reproduction or have this barrier to reproduction. The second barrier to reproduction is called a post-zygotic barrier. Now this is where we get the production of hybrid offspring. So a hybrid is an offspring that's a product of two different species. Here we've got the mule that I was talking about earlier, the product of a mating between a donkey and a horse. Hybrid offspring very often do not survive. Now the reason is, is that species are often characterized in part by the number of chromosomes that they have. And so if you have a hybrid, very often the number of chromosomes in the fertilized cell um, are not compatible. They don't line up correctly. And so the problem comes when that organism tries to produce its sperm or its eggs. Meiosis can't happen correctly. And so because you have different numbers of chromosomes, some that came from mom and some that came from dad, and they don't line up correctly, you don't get meiosis actually occurring. So post-zygotic barriers are very easily seen when you have hybrid offspring, where you actually get an individual, but those individuals either don't survive because of chromosomal incompatibility um, or those hybrids do survive, but they're either infertile or they have reduced fertility. So this is another way that we can limit or that nature 
not us, nature limits um, the interbreeding of different species. So if we're going to define a species and talk about what a species is, we probably need to know how to name it. And there are so many species on our planet that we really need some sort of organizational system. Well, the current organizational system that we use was made in the mid 1700s by a man called Carolus Linnaeus. And he decided to set out and categorize and organize all of the living species, or maybe not all of them, but as many as he could. And he ended up naming some ridiculously high thousands of species throughout his life. And he did this based on looking at morphological or physical similarities between living organisms. And he categorized them into ever increasingly small groups. And at the bottom, the most limited characterization or category is the species level. One up from that is what we call the genus. So a genus is several species that are all similar. Um, and then the species is the very specific group um, that can interbreed and produce viable offspring. So the way that we name species today is based on Linnaeus's system. The first part of the name is the genus. So if we're going to name humans, the genus is Homo. So this is going to um, include things like um, the Neanderthals and some of the other um, early or primitive um, hominid, that means human-like organisms. And we are the only surviving species of the Homo genus. So Homo just means man. And then our species name, that was given is sapien. Now this actually means wise man. This translates to wise man um, because we have big brains and we're smart. Um, but the way that we name them is by the genus and the species. So homo sapiens. The other thing that we do here is um, write it in italics and then we capitalize genus and then our species is lowercase. Now you might ask, well, why don't we just call this the genus man and the species wise? Um, why do we have to use Homo sapien? Well, the reason is that in the 1700s, science was conducted and all learning was, most learning was conducted in Latin. And so this binomial naming system uses Latin names or today often uses Latin sounding names. So let's talk a little bit more about Linnaeus's hierarchical system. So way down here at the bottom, we have the species. So this is the most in, most uh, restrictive group. It's the small group that can interbreed with one another. So we he see here that the species name for this zebra is quagga. Above that, we have the genus Equus. So this is going to include other organisms that are similar to the um, zebra and are closely related, but are not actually considered, considered zebra species. So the genus Equa, Equus, the species quagga. So our species name for the ze our name for the zebra is Equus quagga. Now let's talk about Linnaeus's hierarchical system. So this has actually been refined. This is the current one that we use. Um, Linnaeus's was very similar, um, but this is the modern one. So Linnaeus based his categories in largely we use the same categories that he used um, with his system. They have been modified. They've been changed based on DNA evidence more recently, and we've added and changed some groups. But overall, we've kept the same idea. So our most, our, our largest groups are the domains. We've got bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, or eukaryotes. We're going to come back to those in a little bit. The eukaryotic domain is broken down into kingdoms. These are large groups 
of eukaryotes, and you'll recognize these animals, fungi, plants, and then protists are single-celled uh, eukaryotic organisms. And then we get increasingly smaller groups. So within the animals we have the phylum, the chordates. These are organisms that have the spinal cord and backbone. Then we have the mammals. So there would be other uh, classes of animals in here as well, reptiles, uh, birds, things like that. Um, and then we get our order our family, so these are getting increasingly more specific as we get all the way down to our species name. So we use the biological species concept most often when we are talking about living organisms. But the biological species concept concept is not the only way that we can look at species and in fact it starts to break down when you look at very distinct groups. The biological species concept really only works if you actually have information on breeding and it really only then works if you have very clear information on breeding. If you know that there are no possibilities for these two groups to come together. The problem is, is that it focuses on um, situations where you have two parents and a fertilized egg. Now that doesn't work for all species. And then there are other problems uh, where we have sort of limited information. So I'm going to talk about why the biological species concept doesn't always work, um, keeping in mind that it is the most commonly used one despite some of its shortcomings. So one of the problems with the biological species concept is that we can't classify asexual species. So you can't use biological species concept to classify bacteria and archaea because they don't interbreed with one another. There's no fertilization that happens. They divide by cell division. And so you can't um, use the idea of reproductive isolation because there is not really any isolation because they never could breed to begin with, if that makes sense. Um, and then this is complicated by the fact that bacteria can share genes horizontally. So even though they're not really mating, they can actually pass genes to other types of bacteria, to similarly related bacteria. So we can still define a bacterial species. We just can't base it off of the biological species concept. And then we have fossils. So one of the problems with fossils is that there's not a lot of them. The other problem with fossils is you can't tell which two fossils could have bred or could not have interbred. Um, and so you can't use the biological species concept because you don't know if two fossil types could have interbred. They probably were fossilized millions of years ago and there's no way to know if these two fossils could have mated. The other problem is that you don't know in the fossil record when you actually have speciation occurring because you can have um, two populations that look very different from one another but still interbreed. If you think about human populations, they're very distinct features um, of different human populations based on sort of ancestral locations and they might look very different but we can all still interbreed. We're all still one species. And so because the fossil record is incomplete and because we don't know which fossil animal types could have interbred we have no way of knowing when one species turns into another and when one is just a different type of the same species. Another problem comes from something we call ring species. So if you think about a group of, of organisms, I'm actually going to go back a little bit, um, to this picture here, a ring species. So what this says is that you might have populations all throughout an area, and two populations in the middle can interbreed with one another. And then these two populations over here can interbreed, and then these can interbreed, these can interbreed. But on even though all of these populations can interbreed with one another, these two particular ones cannot interbreed. And so you start to have trouble when you have gene flow around, say, a large geographical area where all of the species or groups in between can interbreed with one another. 
but some of the groups along the way can't interbreed with one another. And so that sort of interrupts the biological species concept because you might have two, two groups that can interbreed and they can interbreed with everyone else, but just not with each other. So where do you put the cutoff for ring species? So our book uses the example of something called greenish warblers, which is the situation where different populations around a particular geographic barrier can interbreed with one another. But in one particular location, the two that are connected by the ring cannot actually interbreed. So then we have this idea of hybridizing species. So sometimes um, hybrids can interbreed with one another, particularly in plants. Um, and sometimes they can sort of back interbreed with parent species. Um, and so sort of drawing the line for these, hybrid, these hybridized species can get a little bit difficult. So there are different ways that we can categorize species. Now biologists like to use biological species concept, particularly when we can look at living populations and see um, what sort of breeding is actually occurring. But as I discussed just in the last few slides, there are some problems with this and we can sort of work around them. Um, and we can take groups of organisms like bacteria and define them in a different way. That biological species concept doesn't have to apply to everything. The other most prevalent um, way to define a species is by the morphological species concept. So this is the big alternative to the biological species concept. The morphological species concept characterizes species based on similarities in physical features. Um, this can be body shape, body size, um, uh, all kinds of, just really anything physical about the organism. So you might look at a group of frogs and say, okay, all of these frogs are the same color green. They have this cool yellow stripe. They have uh, feet and toes that function in the same way. Their legs are the same shape, um, things like that. Um, and the reason that this one is, is helpful is that you can use it for asexual species. You can use this for species that don't interbreed and therefore don't fit the biological species concept. The other good thing about this is that it doesn't require any breeding knowledge. Um, so you can find a new species and categorize it as a species based on morphology and physical characteristics without knowing anything about who it can actually interbreed with. One problem with this is that it can be sort of subjective because you have to choose the right traits. You have to choose the ones that are going to allow you to um, get the best idea of what the species is. And then finally, one last advantage, the morphological species concept, is that you can use this on organisms in the wild. So as I said a minute ago, you don't have to have breeding information. You can begin to define a species as soon as you find something new, um, and you don't have to study it for a long time. If you are looking at the correct characteristics and you choose the right physical features and you look at the other types of species around them, you can actually use this on um, species that are newly discovered in the wild.